The assembly is resumed. Jim Allister has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Executive Office, and I would remind members if they still wish to ask the supplementary question as we go along that they should continue to indicate by rising in their place. The member who tabled the question um, will be called automatically for supplementary. Clerk, please read the question. To ask the First Minister and Deputy First Minister what action is being taken in respect of the data breach affecting victims of historical institutional abuse. And I call the First Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And let me first say that our thoughts are very much with those who have been affected by this highly regrettable incident. The Deputy First Minister and I fully recognise the impact that it will have on victims and survivors. The Interim Advocates Office is sponsored by the Executive Office, but the Advocate operates independently. The Executive Office has been in close contact with the Interim Advocates Office over this incident, which the Interim Advocates Office has formally reported to the Information Commissioner's Office. The Interim Advocates Office has notified and apologised to everyone who received the email. The Interim Advocate has made arrangements for further independent support to be made available to those affected through the Wave Trauma Centre and its counsellors, and a number of people have taken this up over the weekend. This is in addition to those existing support services available through Lifeline and Advice NI. The Executive Office has asked the Group Head of Internal Audit in the Department of Finance to undertake an investigation, and this will begin immediately. Uh, I call Mr. Jim Allister for a supplementary. I'm sure the First Minister recognises that the victims of historical abuse need their privacy more than most. Uh, and therefore, when they discover that their privacy was so spectacularly breached by their supposed advocate, it creates a trauma which many of them are finding very, very difficult. In circumstances where the interim advocate and his office were the culprits, they clearly cannot advocate for the victims on this issue. Doesn't that itself underscore that the interim advocate's position is untenable and he should be relieved of his office? Because he has long since lost the confidence of many of these victims, and indeed the major group that speaks for most of them has disengaged from contact with them. Is this not the last straw for this interim uh, advocate? And in regard to the future, has there been feet dragging on the appointment of a permanent commissioner? Because the interim commissioner was appointed last July, and the last I heard was it's going to be September before we can expect a full-time commissioner. Is that not letting down very badly those who need the most support? Thank you uh, to the member for asking the urgent oral to allow us to come here uh, to reflect on what happened uh, last Friday evening. I think it is absolutely the case um, that we understand how these victims in particular uh, have more to fear from data breaches than anyone else. I absolutely agree with the member in relation to that. And that is why, as well as the information commissioner uh, beginning an investigation, which of course is independent uh, um, and will take its course, uh, we have also set about uh, a fact-finding investigation uh, through the Department of Finance. And uh, we expect that that, we have received the terms of reference for that, and we hope very much that that will give us uh, the facts uh, in a very fast way, and I hope within uh, just a number of days. Uh, as you've heard from the interim advocate, he has said if uh, he is found to be culpable, then of course he will consider his position. Um, and I think the member would agree with me that it is right that we do go through due process in all of these matters, that we do get uh, independent fact-finding brought to the office and of course we will act uh, when we receive that fact-finding information. Uh, we do want to say to all of the victims, um, and I know that there are some 
who, who continue to, and I recognise there are some who do not have confidence in the interim advocate, and we are intervening to try and make sure that there are other ways in which we can advocate on behalf of them. I think it's right that we do that. Some victims uh, do still have confidence uh, in Mr McAllister as their interim advocate. Uh, and in terms of the full-time uh, commissioner appointment, uh, just to bring uh, the House up to date, Mr Deputy Speaker, the selection panel, uh, which of course will operate in accordance uh, with Public Appointments Code, has been appointed. Uh, the competition initiation meeting has already taken place and the competition will be advertised uh, by the end of next week. And uh, It is something that we want to see happen in fast time, but of course we have to again make sure that the processes can stand up. Uh, and uh, believe you me, there will be no delay uh, in terms of appointing the new commissioner. I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. My question relates to information handling systems. Can the First Minister confirm that the information handling systems at the HIA Redress Board are different from those in the Interim's, Interim Advocate's Office? Because going forward, it is important that victims have confidence there that their information will be handled sensitively and appropriately. And can I ask the First Minister how many complaints her department has received about this breach which is addressed in Mr Allister's urgent question? I thank the member for his supplementary uh, question. We do, of course, recognise that there may be concerns from victims who have made applications to the redress panel, which of course is in place now, but just to reassure the member and indeed to the many people who will apply to that portal that the system is completely separate. That's the first thing I want to say about it. And secondly, the redress board has also introduced a system of internal controls because they're very much aware um, that they want to make sure that any potential information um, does not get out into the public domain. They're very alert to the fact that this is very sensitive information. Uh, and they want to ensure that that is all kept uh, in a private fashion. So they are alert to all of that. Uh, in terms of the number of individual uh, complaints to date, the Executive Office have received 15 complaints to date. Each of those have been responded to uh, by our officials and will be taken forward. Apologies. I now call Colin McGrath, the Chair of the Executive Office Committee. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I thank the member for bringing forward this important matter uh, and welcome the opportunity for it be, to be discussed here. I think that should hopefully um, go to show to those uh, victims out in the sector that we do treat this as a very serious, serious issue. And a data breach, obviously, of any kind is very worrying, but whenever it contains information as sensitive as this, um, it is a, a deeply disturbing fact. And I, I welcome too the fact that the, um, the interim advocate has self-referred to the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, and it is crucial that any investigation there is uh, thorough and prompt. And could I ask the First Minister then, what, what can um, the Department, the Executive, do to ensure that that investigation is uh, prompt and swift? And also, you did mention that there were some additional uh, services and resources for uh, anybody that wanted to, to receive that. Could we get some more information on that, on the basis that obviously people will not be able to go to the advocate to ask for direction to those services and just how that would be organised? Thank you. Well, can I thank the Chair for his questions. In relation to the extra support services, those were put in place in very quick time by the Executive Office, recognising uh, the difficulties that have arisen as a result of this data breach. Uh, the Wave Trauma Centre have stepped in uh, to give that additional support. There are uh, supports already in place uh, for um, the, the victims of historical institutional abuse, uh, which are many and varied depending on where you live uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and we want to ensure that there's no gap and that if people have very specific issues that they need to address, then they should do so through the Executive Office uh, as quickly as they can. In terms of the, uh, the investigation, uh, yes, you're right. The Information Commissioner has been uh, uh, self-referred to by the Interim Advocates Office, and it's right that that should happen, and that happened on Friday evening, as I understand it. 
Uh, but we feel in the Executive Office that there was a need to have a much shorter fact-finding piece of work carried out because we have absolutely no control over when the Information Commissioner's Office will report on this incident. Um, as I understand it, sometimes they are not the fastest in terms of uh, uh, coming back, in terms of investigation. So therefore, uh, we felt it was important to have a fact-finding piece of work carried out by the Group Head of Internal Audit in the Department of Finance. And as I say, that has started and it should report uh, very quickly. And I think that that should give um, comfort to the many uh, victims that we are taking this very seriously. We are. We want to get to the bottom of it, and we want to be able to provide them with answers as to how it happened. I call Linda Dillon. My August, Lashkan Corlea. I'm delighted, actually, to hear that there's going to be a separate investigation and that it is going to be prompt, because I acknowledge that, that you don't have any control over the Information Commissioner's Office. I think it is extremely important that these people get all of the information that they can. Because we are dealing with people, and, and, and I have worked with them over a long period of time in relation to this specific issue, but we're dealing with people who have no confidence in those in hierarchy in government and, and so on, and with every right, because those who are in power in their lives before let them down so badly. And we have to acknowledge we have let them down on many occasions, and I think on this occasion we need to ensure that we don't so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Can you give some reassurance just around the fact that all of those who were on that list have been informed? Because I've spoken to some individuals who are saying that that is not the case. And I just would like to be very, very certain that they have been informed and therefore that they have the proper support in place and they've been given that information at the earliest opportunity. I would have concerns that, around that. Well, I thank the member for her, her question and uh, understand she, like indeed many others around the chamber, have been working uh, with the various members of different groups uh, throughout a long period of time. Um, as I understand it, once the breach was identified, and it was identified pretty quickly, there was an immediate attempt to recall the email. Uh, when that didn't work, uh, there was a request went out to delete the email to all the recipients, and then later on a, an apology was also sent to all of the recipients. I would be concerned if she's indicating that there are some people who haven't uh, been contacted, and perhaps if she has those details, she could bring it to the Executive Office, because it's certainly our understanding um, that all those who received the initial data breach uh, were notified, but certainly if there's some difference in that, it would be very helpful and may help indeed in the fact-finding uh, investigation. I call Doug Beatty. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the, uh, the Minister for coming to the TSME to answer these incredibly important questions. I mean, this um, data breach was absolutely devastating, uh, and it has created uh, incredibly harm, uh, harm to people whose anonymity was the only armour they had in their long fight for justice uh, and recognition. Uh, and through a degree of incompetence for many, that has been absolutely destroyed. Uh, and the response to it uh, is solely inadequate, because any letter which says on the 23rd, if you have any questions for my office, get in touch on the 26th, is an inadequate response. So given that the Executive Office is a sponsoring department, can you outline the data breach protocols that are in place? And I don't mean um, information management. I mean, what protocols should have been followed once there was a serious data breach, as we have just seen here? Thank you. I thank uh, the member. I don't have the details of the protocol here with me today, but I'm quite happy to share those uh, with him, and we will write to him with those details. But I do know that the breach was identified very quickly, uh, and to be fair to the Interim Advocates Office, it uh, was indicated to the Executive Office a very short time thereafter. Uh, the advice was given then and from our office to the Interim Advocates Office about the Information Commissioner's uh, Office, uh, and as I say, the Interim Advocate then reported himself to the Information Commissioner's Office. Uh, we have now taken the decision to also have this fact-finding piece as well, which I think will uh, illuminate uh, a lot of the questions that many members need answered, and indeed many of the victims need answered as well. Uh, but as far as the timeliness of reporting it to the Executive Office, I'm satisfied that that was uh, communicated in a timely fashion, uh, but of course it should never have happened in the first place. I call Paula Bradshaw. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, uh, Minister, for, for coming here today. Um, Given the, uh, this latest incident that has um, let down our victims and survivors, 
Is it not time that this House, um, the, the Government, actually issued the formal apology as outlined in Sir Anthony Hart's recommendations in the inquiry? I think it's long gone time that they should have received that. I do thank the member for her uh, question in relation to the apology. Uh, as the House will know, the Hart report recommended that the executive um, should have put out a, a public apology. And one of the issues that the interim advocate has been working on, and of course, all of these issues doesn't make it any more easier to find uh, the appropriate language um, that the victims would like to see in, in an apology. And, they have been working, we have been working with their interim advocate to try and get the appropriate language in place uh, for the apology. We have been carrying out research in other jurisdictions, such as Australia and Canada and the Republic of Ireland, as to what the apology should like, look like. We want it to be an appropriate apology. We want it to be something that is owned uh, by the many victims, and, and therefore it, it is that piece of work that the interim advocate is still engaged on. I recognise that there are some who do not want to engage with the interim advocate, so we now have to put in place other mechanisms to engage with those people who uh, don't want to engage with him. So there is a lot of work to do. Uh, the Deputy First Minister and I have uh, communicated with the institutions. We have said to them that we want to engage with them, uh, not just about the apology, which we do, but we also want to engage with them about redress. Uh, we do feel that the institutions need to step up in terms of redress, it's not just a matter uh, for government. Uh, and uh, we intend to have a, a Zoom meeting with uh, the Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of Ireland. I think it's next week uh, we will be having uh, that meeting that was already set up before this data breach uh, took place. So the apology is progressing. I accept that this incident uh, has made it more difficult to work together cohesively to find the appropriate language, but it's something that we are committed to trying to find a way forward on uh, in the near future. I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her answers here today on this very serious issue. It has been outlined rightly uh, the great deal of distress that this has caused to already hurting uh, victims of historical abuse. And my question would just be in relation to timescales that has been outlined uh, just in the last question in relation to an apology from the NI executive and institutions. Is there any rough indication of timescales for that? And indeed, uh, when you would expect this investigation, which I welcome uh, from the OFM, DFM, in relation to the investigation, when you would expect that to complete? Well, in terms of the latter part uh, of the member's question, I hope that that will happen uh, within days rather than weeks uh, in terms of the fact-finding piece uh, for uh, the head of internal audit. Um, it is a, a very neat piece of work. Uh, there's not too much that needs to be looked into, so I don't think uh, that should take too much time to get to the bottom of. Uh, as I have indicated in terms of the apology, that's very much something uh, that we want to progress. Uh, the interim advocate has been working uh, on the language of the apology and of course when a language has been worked through uh, a submission will come up to the Deputy First Minister and I to approve the apology. It will then go to the executive because it's not just on our behalf, it's on behalf of the executive so of course the Department of Health and the Department of Justice would have a role uh, in relation to that matter as well. I would ask members to be concise in their questions so all members can ask their question. I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you. I accept the First Minister's assertion that the Office of the Independent Advocate uh, operates independently, but it would be also my understanding that the normal governance arrangements between a sponsor department and a body like this would be governed by the management statement and financial memorandum. So may I ask the First Minister, is there such a document? If so, what does it say about data breaches and actions to be taken uh, in, in the event of data protection breaches? And if not, is there a bespoke a protocol that governs uh, these issues. Thank the member for his question. And of course, as I've indicated, whilst the interim advocates uh, office is independent, it does operate under the normal accountability mechanisms uh, and arrangements for uh, an arm's length body uh, to the department. And a work plan has been agreed. Uh, regular oversight meetings uh, take place between officials and the interim advocate. And of course, the executive officers, accounting officers responsible to myself and the Deputy First Minister and is accountable to this Assembly uh, for the uh, interim advocate's use uh, and his functions and everything that he carries out. So 
uh, an official from within the Independent uh, Interim Advocates Office has been designated as Senior Accountable Officer, uh, and he, the office does uh, participate in regular uh, financial and governance arrangements. So the arrangements are as they are for all of the other arm's length bodies, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank uh, Mr Alistair for bringing this as an urgent oil question here today, given the seriousness of what has happened. The First Minister outlined the recruitment process for the new permanent advocate, and that would be advertised next week. Can any clarity be given on when a new advocate is due to be appointed, and if the timescales have had any delay due to COVID or any other matters? Well, uh, yes, as I've indicated, we hope that the uh, competition will uh, be advertised next week and then of course with due process and the way in which uh, these public appointments process take place it will probably be august before the commissioner uh, is in place uh, that uh, leaves a period of time where we will continue to work with the interim advocate recognizing the difficulties that have been raised by many of the members uh, in the chamber today i call jerry Carl. Thank you. Um, I want to pay tribute, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, to all the victims of historical institutional abuse, many of them in my own constituency, and the campaign for truth and justice they have fought uh, over the years, facing many obstacles along the way. Victims are obviously concerned that their privacy and confidentiality has been compromised as a result of this data breach. What assurances can the First Minister and the Executive give that steps have been taken to ensure that something like this never happens again? Well, I thank the member for his question, and just reflecting uh, on one of the other questions, I do, and we do recognise that anonymity has been the only shield that has been left to many of the victims, and we deeply, deeply regret that this has happened. Uh, we will, of course, try to get to the facts as quickly as possible, uh, and then the Deputy First Minister and I will assess uh, the position of the Interim Advocates Office, and indeed he himself has said he will uh, assess his position after uh, the investigation takes place. I think that's appropriate because we all realise the impact this will have had on many victims, uh, the fact that we've had a number of complaints, the fact that a number of victims have had to reach out for help and support over the weekend, I think is an indication of the seriousness of this breach. This isn't a normal just sending out people's addresses. We do recognise that this is a huge uh, breach and is very damaging, and therefore the appropriate action needs to be taken. I call Gordon Dunn. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for coming to the House today. Can the Minister give us an update on the redress payments to victims by the Board? Yes, indeed. And, uh, the redress board uh, is set up and was opened for applications on the 31st of March, Mr Deputy Speaker, and some seven weeks later, uh, the first compensation payments have been made, uh, and we are pleased that those have been made, and it is a significant milestone. It's a very good news story in terms of the redress panel, uh, and the fact that victims and survivors are now starting uh, to receive the compensation, which is long overdue. We all understand that. But it is good that we are making progress in relation to that, and we are very grateful to the President of the Redress Board for his prompt assessment and indeed the organisation of payment of the first round of the applications, all done during what has been a very uh, challenging time for everybody uh, during the coronavirus uh, period. So it is encouraging that even during this time of restriction, uh, that applications are being completed, they are being submitted, uh, and they are being assessed, and the payments are, are now beginning to flow. And that is the end of our urgent questions. Uh, I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments to be changed personnel at the table.